This is an essay about culture, art, and what defines us. This is about who owns our collective memories. This is about property, responsibility, and history. The first time I encountered the idea of media preservation was with ROMs, digitized copies of video games made playable by emulation. I found it fascinating. Growing up, while I certainly would be exposed to new media, I wouldn't always be able to engage in its consumption. Video games in particular were fairly inaccessible because video games have been and continue to remain a reasonably expensive hobby. While rentals made certain titles accessible, the variety of content would be limited, and so I would be unable to play a large portion of these media libraries that was available at the time. Granted, not everything from those libraries was even worth playing. Maybe I wouldn't have personally enjoyed them. Regardless, that was not my decision to make. Even if I'd heard about a new game, I would have to wait until it came to my rental shop. Even if my favorite game ever had come out at the time, I might never know because I'd never have the opportunity to experience it. At least until now. Thanks to the ever-growing popularity of emulation, old video games are more accessible than ever. You can easily boot up your console of choice, head to your favorite digital storefront, and legally purchase the media of your choosing in just seconds. And generally, the quality is acceptable. On its face, this seems to be an excellent alternative to what is the technically illegal sharing of intellectual property. Corporations are allowed to continue to see returns on a product released sometimes decades ago. For the public, entire libraries of content remain easily accessible. The issue, however, isn't what's being offered, but what is not. Many retailers currently selling digital goods are only able to offer fractions of existing libraries. Perhaps it's that these are the most popular titles or that they are able to be published under favorable licensing terms. The reality is that many pieces of content are not actively being preserved because of this. It can even give false impressions to the public that certain pieces of media were deemed irrelevant upon release, didn't sell very well, or just aren't very good. Crucially, it can potentially change historical narrative about cultural relevance by failing to make certain pieces available. Ignoring that each digital storefront may only contain a fraction of early libraries, some marketplaces may no longer be accessible. For some, you may no longer be able to access purchases made previously. If you want to continue to be able to legally access these games, your only options may be to buy physical copies. If any were ever produced on the secondary market at potentially exorbitant prices or buy another device which still allows for connectivity to an existing storefront. In short, this is not preservation by any meaningful metric. External forces are being allowed to determine the means and method of how much media will be preserved. It may even shape our perception of what was important culturally by failing to offer a lack of proper context. While games have their own concerns when it comes to preservation, Lost media has been an ongoing issue for decades. Take film, for example. The Martin Scorsese Film Foundation estimates half of all American films made before 1950 and over 90% of all films made before 1929 are lost forever. While there may be some debate over the exact figure, there is agreement that a significant portion of film history has been lost. That figure almost seems comical until you learn that prior to the 1950s, Nitrate film was used to make movies. While it may have been a critical component in advancing the medium, it is also highly flammable. It has been a key component in multiple fires throughout history, including the 1937 Fox Vault Fire, the 1965 MGM Film Vault Fire, and the 1978 Suitland Film Vault Fire. Films would also sometimes be burned by exhibitors to extract silver particles from their emulsions. Sometimes companies would burn them because they were no longer seen as being important and storing them probably seemed like a waste of money. This has unfortunately led to a vast quantity of cinema simply no longer existing 
in any appreciable fashion. It may be true that those films lost over time were not worth preserving. It is entirely possible that they were disposable. But because those films are lost, we will never be able to make that decision for ourselves. For those that were destroyed, they were rendered valueless to all of us. Despite their potential future impact, they were not permitted the opportunity for us to assess them. Even if they were determined to be devoid of merit during their time, that should not preclude them from being preserved. Films like Faust, Haxan, and Metropolis would all be met with varying degrees of success during their original release, only reaching their level of cultural affect through years of critical reevaluation. So while it is possible their original appraisal may be accurate, we will never know. We are left to speculate as to their importance. Lost media can be looked at as a historical problem. Much in the way of art and culture has disappeared over time. From the house of wisdom and beyond, we have lost or destroyed untold riches of human creativity. Though we may be able to rediscover portions, ultimately we may never have a comprehensive knowledge of civilization because some of it may be gone forever. Where once we recorded history on clay tablets and parchment, much of our culture has found itself inexorably linked to proprietary media formats. While most people will be familiar with VHS, tape cassettes, and vinyl records, standardization is a fairly recent innovation. Even over the course of the past hundred years, media formats have changed drastically. Magnetic tape has seen countless iterations that have been rendered obsolete. Formats like the play tape, RCA tape cartridge, and the 8-track, among others. While many have had varying degrees of success during their lifespan, the nature of the medium dictates that they currently remain largely inaccessible to all but the most fervent archivist. Historic media may present significant difficulties when it comes to preservation. While the technology used to capture audio may be based on standardized principles, tape formats remain proprietary. Therefore, it stands to reason that while extracting the information from any magnetic tape should be possible, practically, it is an expensive and time-consuming process to do so. But even if the technology behind a medium operates to a standard, that doesn't guarantee preservation will be easily achievable. Most mediums remain incompatible with one another. This makes access to the information stored on each an increasingly difficult prospect. While certain formats of discs require hardware that is readily available to the average person, many of these other formats require hardware that increasingly becomes more difficult to obtain. Hardware used to access information stored on certain types of media may be unable to even interface with a modern computing environment. In many instances, original hardware or specialized equipment is required. This ensures that preservation remains limited to a small number of individuals. And for the individual who might be interested in preservation, there may be no guarantee they will be able to access the hardware required for it. Admittedly, those with an interest in older technology often are interested in preservation. However, even with the equipment and desire to do so, they may be limited in what they are able to preserve. All computer storage systems, regardless of design, will reach the point of degradation. Every piece of physical media has a finite lifespan, and we may miss the opportunity to preserve them. In time, cartridges will be rendered unusable. Laser discs will become unplayable. Disc rot threatens to render compact discs useless. Eventually, all physical media will degrade over time. As robust as a technology may be, there is a non-zero chance that all will eventually reach a state of entropy and be lost forever. For many people, the most prescient example of a storage medium is the audio format. Among those, vinyl is well known for its durability. In contrast with other storage mediums, it is not difficult to see why. Audio cassettes have a reputation of being especially fragile, prone to unspooling in audio players, or easily erased by common household magnets. Compact discs have been renowned for their high audio fidelity and wide dynamic range. However, 
compact discs too often found themselves victims of significant wear. While the compact disc itself may not come into contact with the stylus the way a vinyl record does, they were often seen as a mobile alternative. For many years prior to the rise of digital streaming, compact disc players found themselves both cheap and widely available, from car stereo systems to portable CD players. Compact discs often found themselves played in suboptimal environments, being exposed to extreme heat and cold. Physical damage would not be uncommon as they were often stored in binders constructed of materials that could be abrasive to the discs themselves. Even dirt or fingerprints on the reflective side of the disc could render media unplayable. To contrast this, vinyl does not suffer from the same issues. Vinyl records are manufactured to be a single, solid piece of vinyl polychloride. This ensures they are significantly more durable than the brittle plastic shells cassette tape is carried in and much more physically resilient than compact discs. They cannot be demagnetized like tape or suffer from disc rot. In comparison to the fragile nature of either of those mediums, they can be considered effectively durable objects. But vinyl records are not impervious to the ravages of time. They too can become warped, scratched, and rendered unplayable. The act of playing a record with needles that are worn out may damage it. Perhaps the turntable is not properly calibrated has an undersized platter or heavy tone arm. There are many factors which may diminish a record's lifespan. This is not to say that vinyl is a bad format for storage. However, it is to say that it is an imperfect format for storage. Every single format we have ever created has its own points of failure. Given enough time, every method we currently have available for preserving our art and culture will succumb to entropy taking that information with it. There may be a question about why preserving media matters. The idea feels more philosophical than practical. We don't need media for survival. But as a species, we are bonded by our shared cultural experiences. We enjoy them, and they enrich our lives. Historically, preservation has been in the form of stories or songs that have been handed down from generation to generation. Though printed works have existed for thousands of years in the form of carved tablets and handwritten parchment, the easy reproduction of works has allowed for the most efficient transmission of expression. In particular, the printing press is of great importance. While it is true that we have a number of written works which have been preserved dating back to 3500 BCE, we see a significantly greater number of published works after the invention of movable type. No longer would humanity be forced to script each crafted word by hand. We could produce significantly more copies of works and share a wide range of ideas efficiently. We would see shifts in the types of literature that exist. Literacy would no longer remain largely exclusive to those in power. The impacts of the invention of movable type are still being felt to this day. The single greatest innovation brought to us by the creation of movable type would be its accessibility. Not simply to create, but to allow for the free flow of ideas because it was more convenient to do so than it had been at any other point in time in history. And so, our knowledge and understanding of the world around us is informed by the accessible duplication of the written word. Scientists, doctors, and others have been afforded the opportunity to share from history's greatest failures and triumphs because of the ability to share knowledge to a degree once considered unimaginable. It took Marco Polo 24 years to return home from China. Contrast this with the Marco Polos of today who were able to instantly document and share their discoveries. But what would happen if we had to wait 24 years for every scientist to share the results of their research? Science is heavily based upon pre-existing research, while we often like to consider science by its most notable milestones, in terms of understanding the world, we find it is more iterative than innovative. We largely build our understanding of the world on small discoveries rather than substantial ones. For culture, the experience is largely the same. Culture and art are not formed whole cloth from nothing. So the saying goes, everything is a remix. Art as we know it is the result of thousands of years of reinterpretation. For example, 
Punk is an iteration of traditional rock music, made only possible through the development of the electric guitar. The electric guitar was created to be able to hear the instrument during live performances. And so, like many other forms of modern art, it is only possible through the conglomeration of the various threads that it has drawn from history. Much like punk's evolution, we can see similar patterns in other artistic movements. They inevitably develop into what they are because they are able to recontextualize what came before. They become wholly new things sprung forth, greater than the sum of their parts. As do you or I, we often find ourselves defined by cultural memories, founded upon well-established cultural traditions. Many existing societal norms find themselves deeply entrenched in ideas originating thousands of years ago. Our understanding of human history gives us a better perspective into who we are today and who we could be tomorrow. And so, if all we are is what we remember, what happens when we forget? While the burning of the Library of Alexandria is undoubtedly one of the most famous and tragic events in history, we potentially stand at the threshold of an infinitely larger existential threat to culture. It is all but certain that currently existing physical media will fail in time. Many would argue that it is irrelevant to worry about, that what is most culturally important will continue to remain widely available. While this seems like a perfectly reasonable statement to make about media preservation, it is a dangerous presumption to make. In the world of creative properties, often what we determine as the factor of worthiness is financial value. This is often the easiest metric to calculate. We can easily see if a project has generated interest by its success or failure to generate a profit. However, this metric feels arbitrary. While it could be argued that a film that has been financially successful is culturally important, we must ask ourselves first, whose culture? While American cinema has undoubtedly gained popularity the world over, there are several countries have produced films of similar financial return which may have little saturation with the wider western audience. Should these films be deemed unimportant because they did not reach equivalent cultural saturation? With regards to financial return, it could be argued that while financial success shows interest in a property, a property can also become financially successful by producing a film with a lower budget, a novel concept, or just a good marketing campaign without reaching significant awareness. And what of the films that may be culturally relevant and are profitable, but not as profitable as other properties? Should we ignore those? And what about properties which are no longer financially viable? Many classic serials or film noir hold little or no financial value because they have fallen into the public domain. For rights holders, there is little incentive to ensure their preservation but as cultural artifacts, they remain of vital importance. Much like how Packle Bell's Canon in D has found itself remixed and repurposed countless times, so do we find their ideas invoked time and time again. Of course, it has been long accepted that preservation of history should remain sponsored by the public interest. While museums and art galleries often function as public attractions, they are not solely profit-driven. They are able to operate like public utilities without the need to worry about return on investment. That is not to say that the public interest is impervious to failure, but it has support systems in place that are not beholden to financial interests. We should seek to fund those who are not financially incentivized to make determinations about what should be accessible to the public. While long-term information storage becomes an increasingly expensive proposition, Public management is vital. When knowledge becomes managed by the public interest, it has the best opportunity to ensure it remains accessible to all. We live in an age where information is readily accessible to the public. But what we take for granted as access to art and culture is only what is permitted. It is easy to mistake free access for altruism. There is a question about what can be done to ensure the preservation of media for future generations. This continues to be an issue for preservationists 
as much as it does the public. In some ways, media preservation faces challenges that traditional historical preservation does not. Dedicated preservationists of today will face a myriad of difficulties, most critically data storage. There may be some long-term solutions which claim to last upwards of 1,000 years, but these themselves face challenges of their own. For example, if we assume that the amount of current data online is in the range of zettabytes, you would need tens of billions of compact disks, and that number grows exponentially with every upload. While file sizes can be mitigated with compression, current physical media is still only able to capture fractional percentages of what is estimated to be online, and the claims that certain types of media will last hundreds or even thousands of years is currently just that, a claim. Undeniably, they may be built to a more rigorous standard, but if history has shown us anything about data storage, it's that nothing is foolproof. Because they are intended to last centuries, there is no way for us to genuinely validate that claim. Until we can show them operating for the time span indicated, it cannot ever be a guarantee. And then, there is the question of obsolescence. While we can be reasonably assured that 100 years from now, we will still be able to read existing physical formats, because we have historically been competent at ensuring we preserve the devices we need to play them, it may be relatively safe to assume that a piece of media created today will be able to be accessed in the future. After all, we are still capable of playing wax cylinders or acetate discs which were in use at least that long ago. But beyond that, will the tools needed remain accessible? While we certainly are doing a fair amount to preserve information today, no one knows what the future will hold. So what do we do? Right now, it seems like there is no good answer to the problem. Information, if left unchecked, will always seemingly head towards entropy. It would seem our best solution to this currently would be creating multiple levels of redundancies on new hard drives regularly. But much like other forms of digital storage, these two can be prone to failure. So then we rely on things like cloud storage to provide further redundancies. Cloud storage is expensive, but can generally ensure that your data is safe as long as you're able to pay for it. But then you are entrusting a third party and concerns about data breaches aside, there is also the threat of insolvency. Much like any other form of storage, they can and do fail. Reliability is simply a perception. In the industry, bankruptcies are not uncommon. Companies are run by people, and people can always risk the chance of failure, no matter how seemingly well organized they are. One of the most critical issues with media preservation is to raise awareness as to its importance. We may not see it in our daily lives, but we are living history. One day, the societies we live in will be learned about in textbooks, much like we do with our ancestors. Our stories of today will become the thing of myth that go on to influence the storytellers of tomorrow. But we need to ensure that they survive until then first. So what do we do? Perhaps we accept that it is a significant effort going far beyond the purview of a single individual or organization. There may come a time when a single form of storage media is resilient to physical degradation and data entry that will be able to store an infinite amount of information preserved for countless generations. Until then, we may just have to accept that it is a vast shared responsibility that if we seek to preserve our culture for future generations, we must take action ourselves, be that in the form of active preservation or even just taking the time to communicate what matters to us today.